it, it's aimed at players and coaches, so therefore I'll minimise medical terminology. But I think uh, uh, therapists and medics will will take a lot away from it as well. And I plan to do some more in the future directly aimed at therapists and medics as well. But I think uh, there is usable information for everyone here. So. Um, just the teams and the people I've been working with. On me, I'm, I'm from uh, Newport in Wales. I went to Cardiff University a long time ago now, 1997 to 2000. Um, I uh, then just started during my student years and my early years working with uh, amateur teams, um, Division Six Welsh Rugby, uh, Cardiff High School Old Boys, just getting my fingers uh, Dirty, as they say, and and then from there, then just worked with kind of Met, um, Bedworth, lots of other small Welsh clubs, and while working in NHS, and then moved on to um, uh, decided to move to London to do my masters, and at that time worked with Blackheath, and then uh, London Welsh were going full time professional, and from there uh, I interviewed for that, and then got that job and was with them for six years full time then straight on to Dragons Rugby after that, and after Dragons for about three and a half years, uh, did a little bit of Canada, and then the last four years I've done with Russia, which ended with the, the outbreak of the war. We were about to go play Georgia, um, London 2012 in between that. So um, yeah, that's, that's me in a nutshell. So tonight, um, what we're gonna do is, uh, we're going to have a brief review of the common rugby injuries, okay? And then an, an injury prevention overview, or as I like to, as people like to call it, that injury redu reduction strategies or injury risk mitigation. And my top 10 tips, um, which will we'll cover a lot of different areas. And, and then some Q&A. So I'll get through the presentation. Q&A, if, if you wanna put the questions in the chat, um, that might be an easy way to do it, um, and we can take it from there. I'd, I, I'd like, uh, obviously, players and coaches, if they've got any particular questions, just try and give them priority. But if you're a therapist and you want to ask a question, make sure that it is, like I say, in, in non-medical jargon, so that uh, and, and that the question would be would be useful for the players and the coaches as well in that respect, if that makes sense. Okay. So first of all, looking at rugby itself, and um, we all know it's a collision sport, not just a contact sport, but a collision sport. And, and the best data comes from the, the English uh, Premiership uh, RFU Prem Rugby Audit, which is the longest running audit. Uh, and the therapist in the room will be aware of that. And I, I had the uh, pleasure of uh, adding to that during my time with London Welsh. Um, so this is a kind of summary of the match injuries, the most common match injuries um, from 2015, 2020. So it varies a little bit from year to year, but I've put the trends on the right hand side. You know, uh, concussion is up there at the moment as obviously one of the most common uh, injuries and has been for a while. Um, shoulders, predominantly the AC joint, but we also, we also have label tears and slap tears amongst that dislocations um, these being the most common not the not the injuries that lead to the biggest loss of time uh, and then we've got various knee injuries ankle injuries ankle syndesmosis the ankle lateral ligament injuries so in consensus head shoulder ankles knees uh, and thigh contusions and then the non-contact injuries being predominantly uh, like I say, it varies from year to year, but, um, you know, hamstrings and calves being most common, uh, quadriceps. And this is the elite senior men's uh, data. Training injuries and why this is important is, again, is it, it varies uh, significantly compared to the the match data and, and we're in pre-season period at the moment. So these are the types of injuries that people will see in a pre-season period. So our injury prevention uh, strategies will vary across the season, depending on what the demands are, 
of the player during that time. So obviously the demands of in con, you know, in season collision matches may be a little bit different to the demands of pre season. So our injury preparation and the off season should be preparing for what's about to happen in the pre season. A lot of running um, and potentially a lot of soft tissue or tendon injuries. Um, so you can see there again, hamstring, calf, adductor, Achilles, um, calf, hamstring. It's uh, those are the key areas. Uh, so if you can, if we can target hamstring and calves in prevention in the preseason period, that would go a long way to uh, to help reduce injuries during this period. And I don't want to just talk about the elite game. Uh, I want to talk about grassroots and, and schoolboy rugby as well. And there's been a lot of research recently comparing what's going on in the elite game and uh, compared to what's going on at uh, grassroots and, and schoolboy level. So this is a recent paper uh, come out a few months ago this year. And again, common themes compared to the elite game, shoulders, heads, knees, ankles. Uh, they looked at position specific here and they just, in the, in the paper, they just separate into forwards and backs. Uh, uh, and in schoolboy rugby, uh, in this, this cohort in Ireland, um, forwards are getting injured more than backs uh, and they had different types of injuries as well. So forwards would be getting more head and neck concussion type injuries, neck injuries and shoulder injuries. And, um, and backs were getting more ankle sprains and knee or non-contact injuries. So where this information is useful is potentially you, you, can, you can target that and you can target the injury prevention priorities of those two groups, forwards and backs. You could target them slightly differently due to the nature of the demands of um, their roles during the game. So I think these these papers are very useful, and, uh, and and obviously future research then can further uh, pull apart you know each individual positions within the forwards and the backs, uh, and I think that that helps to individualise by position, and I've always liked to look at several things, uh, and the most easiest way of looking at uh, injury prevention or reduction strategies is targeting that player's past history of injury um, and also then the the injuries that are most common by their position and, and that's a good way to start um, in rugby itself. Um, a quick point of note here especially with the uh, the high incidence of concussion injuries and although majority of them um, uh, resolve in a short period of time. Uh, obviously, there's lots of research going on around concussion. I'm not going to get too detailed into concussion here, but there's one point that I do want to make, um, which is there's been several studies that have pointed to a greater risk of total injury of, of, of various other rugby injuries after having had a concussion injury. So I think the important thing to take from this is that uh, th there are probably neuromuscular consequences and very, very mild effects on the brain, um, which uh, which may be hard to to pick up with our our, our screening and our um, scat tests and so on. So, what I'm talking about is um, vestibular testing, and, and again, so what I mean by that is balance testing and vision testing. There are, there are issues that, that uh, could happen after a concussion, which, which might affect uh, some of these areas below here, someone's balanced vision, their reactivity, their attention, their decision-making, and all those things could be very important uh, to, or are very important to a player uh, when they're on a rugby field, if they've got to make a decision on, on stepping, if they've got to make a decision on uh, making a tackle and having you know, normal balanced vision, uh, and uh, fast kind of coordination reactivity could be quite important. So um, this, we'll talk about this later, a little bit later about how, uh, how our injury pr prevention reduction programs can, can target this area. So it's just another reason why we should take 
there's, there's, there's enough reasons why we should take concussion seriously as it stands at the moment. This is another reason, if you're unaware of that, why uh, we need to make sure that everything is completely right before players return to play. So, a little quote, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, Benjamin Franklin. This is uh, very important and, and that's the basis of this talk. So hopefully, um, with the 10 tips and the information I'm going to give across the board to whoever's uh, listening, this should be something that everyone can utilise. And if everyone goes away and, and utilises one new thing and it, and it helps to reduce the overall burden on, on their rugby club, on their rugby team, on their squad, whether you're a player doing programmes yourself or if you're a coach and you're, you know, adding in some, some uh, new programmes this season, um, or if you're a medical member of medical staff, support staff, uh, and you've got a few new ideas, if it helps, then I'm, I've done my job. So can we prevent injuries? And that's the big question. And, that, and that's why I've been talking about this, this term injury prevention. Um, and um, the answer is no, we can't prevent all injuries, okay? Um, because rugby is a is a collision sport not just a contact sport and things happen so this is one of our players um from the world cup and against ireland he's sliding in as they're starting to pick up some momentum score some tries against uh, us um he slides in to try and stop this try and he, he slams his knee dashboard injury as we call it um hyperflexes his knee as he contacts the post um and damages um one of the one of the major ligaments of the knee push the cruciate ligament so that's just a blunt trauma so, so we can't and there's lots of other uh injuries which we can't prevent happening because that's the nature of the game so if anyone tells you what you see on social media this uh, approach or this treatment or this prevents all injuries or stops injuries then uh they're lying so that's why we, we've come to a change in terminology. So we talk about reducing the risk of injury, and that's that's all we can do. Players can be proactive and reduce the risk of injury. Coaches can provide a uh, a, a safe environment and provide good programs that uh, encourage um, uh, increased performance and injury injury reduction. Uh, and, and that's what we're trying to do as, as therapists and rugby medics as well, as we're trying to reduce, uh, and mitigate against the risk of injury. Uh, and hopefully we can talk about how you can do that as a player uh, or as a coach in this presentation. And traditionally, injury prevention in rugby would fall on the hands especially in professional sport you know 10 years ago it would fall in the hands of the uh, the physiotherapist 10 10 20 plus years ago um and it would be the medical medical team's responsibility to prevent injury um but really uh in this current in the current demands of the the modern game and um you know the the high injury incidents it's everyone's responsibility it's just everyone has different roles so whatever if you're a player coach uh, therapist if you know uh, everyone's role is to improve rugby performance um, and usually um, by uh, doing the right thing in in the various elements be it in the gym be it tackle technique coaching uh, communicating listening to players and and, and doing the right thing by players uh, that's going to improve rugby performance and at the same time reduce the risk of injury so everyone needs to be aligned you know at the end of the day everyone wants to win but everyone needs to to focus on on winning alongside having good uh player welfare and i think one of the biggest things that's come out in recent years and there was a paper that came out by a fifa um good communication is, is the starting point between players coaches and support staff and there's a, a football paper that, that showed that teams that have got better cohesion between the players, coaches and support staff and those better internal communication dialogues led to better performances, 
a decreased risk of injury and increased play of availability for full matches. So it starts with communication. And I'm going to start with the player first, okay? Um, because rugby players need to take responsibility for their own bodies, okay? And this is a very important part. You, 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 if you want to be a professional or if you want to be the best that you can be and, you've, and, you, and, you, and you want a performance mindset, you need to take ownership of your own body and your own health, okay? Support staff are support staff. They're there to support you, to look after you as best they can, okay? And to do that, first of all, you need to be a good communicator, okay? You need to be a good communicator with regards to your, your health, okay? Your physical status, um, injuries, pick up during a game, after a game, okay? You need to be a good communicator, okay? So that helps therapists to help you and it helps coaches to, to plan and make plans for the following week, okay? And you need to have good habits and good routines you know um especially young players there's been some research to say that you know sleeping less than eight hours a night um increases the risk of injury and some of this stuff isn't going to be you know um groundbreaking but it's the we, and we a lot of us know this information but it's it's instilling the routines and the habits and that's the hardest part is actually doing it and doing it well consistently over a week over a month over a season over multiple seasons okay you need to eat well nutrition needs to be good you need to have a good training attitude that's not just in the gym okay you need a good training attitude in the gym but also a good training attitude on the field okay and you'll be wanting to improve things and we'll talk about tackle technique later okay and you, you need to look after your recovery okay and and i say strength training and i mean strength and conditioning um this is a massive part of the game now and, and, and you can't escape it. Uh, and there's direct, direct links between that and injury risk. Um, so, you know, you need, you may not like the gym. Some people don't like the gym, but you need to do it to, to survive in this game. Um, and then if we're going to dig a bit deeper, then it's understanding your individual needs for yourself and for your position. Okay. For your injury history, Okay, you need to know, uh, and again, you need to communicate with your needs with with the staff that you've got working with the coaches, with the support staff, in regards old injuries, and you need to understand the demands of your specific position uh, within rugby, uh, and there are specific injuries that that follow specific positions. So you've already got areas here between your own injuries, and and your position specific injuries that you can target help to reduce your injury rugby coaches and I'll, I'll, I'll keep this brief but yeah good technical coaching you know especially around tackle technique um uh it's it's more often than not from the research it's the tackler and not the ball carrier that often gets injured so you can see the importance of that there not just concussion but if we're thinking about neck and shoulder injuries um and obviously uh having uh, and i know you, a lot of coaches they're overworked already there a lot of coaches are voluntary and don't get paid um but we need to spend the time understanding and communicating with these players and understand how they're doing week to week um with the players and with the staff um if you manage staff and medical staff and snc staff you, you've got to try and do whatever you can to give them the time to do the job and also you know, assist them to try and get the equipment they need to do their job where possible, where budgets allow. And then, either with the support of strength conditioning coach and the medical team, but you need to consider how much training, volume and intensity you're doing from week to week, how much contact, how much running, uh, and planning those recovery weeks as well. And, and obviously, obviously, there's lots of good sources of information that on the internet, on, on the World Rugby sites as well. Um, and you need to be flexible, you know, to, to look at areas, rearrange fixtures, congested periods, uh, and, 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 and managing that load around that. And I know it's a challenge, it's difficult. Um, I know it's never just Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. There's so much planning, so much communication and work that goes around that, but uh, there's people that do that well. More often than not, 
you know, have happy players and uh, successful teams and happy staff. And last but not least, us rugby therapist medics, okay, um, no matter what level that you work at in the game, the first thing we need to do is think about doing the right thing, okay? And we need to balance performance and player welfare. And, and that's, that's the challenge, but at the end of the day, we need to do the right thing and do the basics well with regards to medical care and injury prevention. And, and, and most, most therapists uh, often work on their own with a lot of players. Um, so coaches and players need to support this, support these support staff and medical staff and help them to do their jobs, make life easy for them uh, because uh, we are heavily outnumbered um, at, at all levels, even at the elite level, it's it's challenging, and, and some some medical teams are smaller than others. Um, so we need to try and get good protocols and systems in place. Okay, with regard comms, with regards to you know medical assessments and injury review clinics, and have consistency there. Um, we need to make sure that we've got the minimum essential equipment to do our jobs. Uh, and the time required to do our jobs. Um, and that's something which you can negotiate early on in the season now with your with your coaches and your s &C staff. Rapid early acute di accurate diagnosis obviously is very important and that's still one of our key skills is trying to get that. And that's something I've always prided myself in, in my six years at London Welsh, we didn't have a massive medical budget. It got bigger as the years went by, but having the clinical skills still to this day, having that clinical skills to, to be able to, you know, operate as far as possible without the need of imaging and scans, okay? And generally, um, still to this day, for modern scans, it's, it's because I am thinking that it may lead to a different route as in a player may need surgery or a player may need a different type of intervention as opposed to getting the diagnosis. The clinical diagnosis is pretty much 85-90% uh, in my hands. It's just uh, determining whether or not um, more complex interventions or medical care are needed. Rapid treatment and good early communication as soon as you know what's going on with the coaches and support staff. So everyone is uh, in sync with regards to that player's availability for the following week or next, you know, next four to six weeks, if that's known. Good rehabilitation systems and, and good return to play decision-making systems. And I know that's a challenge if you have limited time with players, but um, it's definitely, you know, with modern technology, there are ways of being able to, to give uh, good care and um, having a process in place of how someone might rehabilitate before the injury even happens. It is possible for a lower limb or for an upper limb injury. And you can put those things in place long before an injury actually happens. So top 10 tips. So again, if I've got my head physio mindset on here and if um i was a player uh, again it's all about as a rugby player we need to take responsibility for our body so this is health first this is this is making sure that um that we do the basics really well first and we don't want anything serious to happen to anyone okay so players you need to take responsibility for your own health okay and brain and heart being probably the two most important areas of our body, first of all, okay? Um, cardiac screening, uh, that is freely, freely available in the UK via CRI, Cardiac Risk in the Young. They do sessions all over the country and you can organize sessions, okay? And uh, between the teams and the clubs, having defibs are available that can save lives, okay? Um, and, and, and if you haven't got a defib at your club, it's something which people should aim for um, by donations and charity. Um, very, very important. But as a player as well, you know, it's your responsibility if you have allergies, if you have medical conditions, you need to make people aware of this because we don't want surprises on the pitch and we don't want surprises on tour or anything like that. 
um, and it's usually comes down to good communication between the support staff and uh, the therapists and the, and the players but if there's minimal medical coverage then obviously um, someone needs to take responsibility for that and the player can take responsibility for that and let the people organizing the the club uh, and the training and the matches of their you know be aware of their medical conditions site testing seems like a funny one but um, there's quite a few players that I know and 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 myself as a physio as well where my vision went downhill from the age of 17 18 and it continued to deteriorate to the age of 30 and I think especially over the last few years uh, due to COVID and lockdown a lot of people haven't attended um, site testing uh, and I think it's such an important area you don't want to let suboptimal vision it's very common you see a lot of people doing hand to eye coordination activities uh, and training um, lots of work the ball uh, and lots of peripheral, peripheral vision training but we need to make sure our normal vision is optimal first so so make sure you get that checked and make sure you keep up your appointments concussion history and this is very important um, in elite clubs in wales and, and england uh, we have a, a joint medical records which follows the player around below that level uh, this isn't common and um, it's down to, I think, the player to, to keep note of their concussion history almost, and, and this follows the next point, is to keep their own medical history, okay, and make sure um, that therapists that you're working with, if you're arriving at new clubs, are aware of your concussion history and aware of your injury and surgical history, okay, um, so that we can manage you accordingly. I think that's very important we, in the elite game. Um, especially the new change of rules, uh, the, the six days turnaround HA is, is gone now and uh, players that have got uh, a concussion history or have been stratified as, that, stratified as having a uh, history of concussion problems, um, the earliest they'll be able to return now is, is 12 days. Um, and obviously in the community game, grassroots game, it's longer than that, but it's, it's very important that you, you keep track of that uh, so keep it on your phone, your injuries, your surgical history, very, very important. Keep that up to date. Second tip, and something which probably uh, the first five, six years of my career, which was early 2000s, I was still so focused on the, the rehab and the diagnosis, stuff like that. It's an area which um, wasn't until... Um, I started working full time in the environment, I realized how important it was to have good knowledge of the principles and practices of strength and conditioning training. And, and what I mean by that, again, for the younger players and the uh, younger staff in the room, uh, it's, it seems like common knowledge. But there's a few things which um, still keep cropping up. Um, and, and how that strength and condition is developed. Um, it's making sure that we haven't just got a, a bodybuilding mindset and we need to make sure that what we're doing as close as possible is targeted to improve performance and decrease injury risk. So the, one of the main tenants and purposes of strength and condition is, is to reduce injury risk in, in athletes and in rugby players. So the programs need to be targeting both performance and injury risk at the same time. And rugby specific and, and position specific as well. And the needs for a front row prop obviously can be quite different to the needs of a, a wing or a fullback. And we need to make sure that it meets the demands of rugby. Explosive power and not just double limb, okay? Bench press, squat deadlift all very good exercises to build maximal strength but where the injuries sometimes happen on the field it happens not in during heavy slow double legged or double arm movements but in rapid explosive single limb movements and we need to make sure that programs cover those areas um, and one of my bugbears and I think it's changing now, but I mean, it's always difficult to fit in all this additional 
you know small injury prevention drills and stuff like that but i think it could be done quite easily just like hand eye coordination drills can be done in rest between sets simple uh balance exercises angle stability drills or even um you know banded neck work could be done between squatting and uh, bench press sets if you've got two or three plus minutes between sets and i think it's an easy way just to combine the two so you're really using your time really really uh efficiently within the gym um and your own personal injury actually you know again as, as i said earlier on it depends on your injury history uh so if you've got a history of hamstring or calf injuries you need to find a way around your training week and your match schedule to fit those in uh, and quite commonly in the elite game um people that are fitting in that extra hamstring or calf work um, after the last training session of the week before the day off. So they've got a clear 48 hours and not doing it too close towards matches or training, especially if there's lots of high speed running uh, planned. So it's just about timing where you fit those extras in. And obviously you've got more opportunity in the off season and pre-season to do that. And as I said earlier on about the, with regards to the lower limb, I think, um, there's been much uh, decent long-standing history with regards to maximal strength, um, plyometrics, power type exercises, very, very common in the lower limb. Not so common in the upper limb, and I think that, and, and also it's the positions which uh, injuries happen in often, often a lot of the time some of the the shoulder injuries are happening in really wide arm positions and a lot of our weights can be quite nice and tight with the bench press or shoulder press and double arm so we need to think about how we can challenge power in these wide single arm positions where where often players feel most vulnerable and some examples of that here let's see if this works i don't know if it will some examples i, I do put lots of um, drills and uh, well, upper limb. I've been focusing a lot in recent years on upper limb rate of force development drills, explosive drills, power drills that players can use. Let's see if this works here. So here we go. So it's just an explosive warm up drill for the upper limb, which I use as a bit of a dynamic warm-up or in the rehabilitation process. Here, here we're testing the arm in wide ranges. So we're preparing a player before he goes back to contact, before he starts doing live contact with other players. We have a bit of a reactivity drill here and a rate of force development drill, okay, where he's got to catch a moving punch bag in long range positions. And I'll progress that here with an exercise you can do on your own without a punch bag, where we are just hitting the wall in wide positions at full contact, trying to be as explosive as possible. And you can see here, it's something which might get missed if we only do really heavy slow weights and i'm not saying that the heavy slow maximum strength training, it is very important okay but the injuries in rugby they happen in split seconds that's uh sorry sorry about the music there but my point being is that these injuries often happen uh, very quickly, very rapidly, and we need to train that shoulder to be dynamic and reactive uh, and be powerful in very wide arcs and angles, and that, that might help assist uh, in reducing shoulder injuries. Okay. So... Looking at individuals now and looking at, at screening, if, if you do have time to screen and how players can screen themselves for injuries, that's, that's something that I want to try and get the concept across is how do I 
look after myself and, and we can take what happens in the elite game and, and what happens in clubs, uh, professional clubs around the world. Uh, and there'll be variations across club to club. There are ways that we can turn some of that information and make it very easily used at uh, grassroots amateur and semi-pro level. So first of all, we, we talked about the risk factors, knowing the risk factors for rugby and knowing the risk factors for the time of the season, be it pre-season, off-season versus in-season. And from the research as well, we know that certain players in certain positions are at greater risk of specific injuries. So winger back free could be increased risk and there is increased risk of, of, of hamstring injury. So therefore, knowing that, if you're including Nordics or single leg reverse hypers, double leg reverse hypers into your program, that's injury prevention. You're targeting improving your hamstring performance and reducing your hamstring injury risk based on uh, injury risk related to your, your position. Okay, so, uh, and, and we need to find a way of fitting that into the season, okay? And, and we might need to vary that across the season. There'd be, there'd be times where we can hit that work really hard if there's breaks or in the preseason. And then there are times where in season, we might have to pull back on that because there's a lot of uh, a lot of running and high speed running in matches and, and in the training week. So we need to find ways that we can incorporate this stuff in, and that will vary uh, and it'll undulate across the season. Uh, and and then alongside the, the position specific risks, there are each individual's risks based on their past injury history. Um, and, and, and it's important, and I think players that have been out injured for a long time, so uh, players that have coming back from a shoulder injury or an upper limb injury and they haven't been doing rugby training, it, it's not just, my concern is not just the, um, the risk to that injured part, but it's risk to other areas. If they, if they haven't done a lot of high-speed running because they've been in a sling, uh, and, and they've lost a lot of uh, exposure to high-speed running. Uh, we need to try and make sure those individuals top up on those areas so that they don't pull a hamstring or a calf after their first game or first couple of games back after a, a shoulder dislocation. So it's just being mindful of that other areas. And different elite teams do different things. And, and these are some of the common things that commonly get used. Uh, and I think players, you know, if you learn about these, players can learn to test themselves. I think it's very important, important that they, they learn to test themselves because, again, uh, it's very hard in small medical departments for support staff to screen all players, then keep on top and monitor all those players and provide, you know, new diagnostic assessments, treatment, rehabilitation. So I think players learning how to do this is very important. So it's like a bit of a mini MOT. So, so players can learn to track their health, their sleep, their nutrition, their soreness, their stress levels with, with all the kind of modern apps that we've got these days available to us. Um, you can uh, use that data to inform yourself. And, and obviously, if there's any, any issues and you're not, not well again, the important part there is the communication aspect to the coaches to the support staff that there is a problem based off that 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 subjective data that you're recording and that's very easy to do what can you do then to actually screen your joints and your muscles and your ligaments yourselves and, and i think it's about keeping it simple really uh, and some of the most common simple tests that get used are the the knee to wall okay um that's uh an ankle mobility test and and there we're looking at not just the flexibility of the calf muscles and the range of the joint we're looking at that uh, the two together to give us an idea of, of how the, the ankle and the, the foot and ankle is operating so we can get our own figures for that we can measure that especially if we've got a history of ankle injuries or calf or achilles problems in the past or, or knee patella tendon pain it's useful to measure a sit and reach is a, a nice simple one which just give a general overall 
uh, view of the hamstrings, of the spine, of the lower back and hips. Nice, easy test to see the readiness. And again, if you find something, you can you can record that. And if it it if you're testing that, you know, week to week or training session or training session, and you see a difference, then obviously then you you can you can try and do something about that. And uh, and if that doesn't work to clear it, be it you know simple activation, stretching, mobility work, then obviously um, coaches and the, and the therapists might need to know about that, that you've got a potential hamstring issue. Uh, for the kickers, and for the back three, um, the people that have a greater groin load due to the kicker demands, uh, you can learn to do a simple adductor squeeze with a speedometer. Again, it's a very inexpensive piece of kit to have around at a rugby club. And again, if you if you're taught how to do that, okay, and there's lots of videos online um, teaching you how to do that, or you can get the therapist to show you how to do that. That's something that you can use to monitor your groins over the season. And then again, for the shoulders, um, something uh, that, as well as looking at the full range of motion, something dynamic like a plyo press up. If you know if you can do a plyo press up, and it feels explosive and feels normal, then your shoulders are, are going to be in a pretty good. Uh, position to to handle the demands potentially of, of your training week and, and, and games so i think it's really important that you can develop your own little system of self-testing and that way then you know you get to be the master of your own body understand your body and and, and, and importantly communicate that to the coaches and therapists if you're experiencing issues So, there we go. And what programs can you do? There's millions of different programs out there, and and people, you know, social media, it can get a bit overwhelming. Um, this has got some good evidence behind it, and most uh, other programs that I see, you know, look very similar to this, or have got, you know, uh, th this can be useful if you want to um, um, do injury prevention across or injury reduction strategies across a whole team and whole squad and I think the people that deliver sessions should have a look at this again some good research has come out on it uh, this year uh, and the interesting findings were the the teams that performed three sessions a week were consistent completed whole phases and progress those phases at the lowest um, injury rates and non-contact injury rates compared to other teams that only did one a week or, um, or, or weren't adherent to it. So it's worth looking at this. I think the important point is there is you can probably, you know, develop something similar or, or something that's a bit more specific for your team, but it was the, you know, Two to three sessions a week short little blocks okay it was done consistently it was done over a period of time and it was done progressively throughout a season and i think that is uh that's probably more important than the actual um choices of exercises themselves um so it's getting a plan and being consistent and you can do that in group group sessions for five to seven minutes and uh, nice and short beginning or the end, depending on what you're doing, um, or individually. Tip four, this is always the challenge. What's my diagnosis? And it's, diagnosis is, is very important because it basically is the foundations for the next phase, which is appropriate injury management, treatment, rehabilitation, and so on. Um, and again, I think, with the advent of social media um there's a lot of people saying a lot of different things on the internet and it can be a challenge uh, to know what to do uh information overload so i think as it is the basis of successful rehabilitation you as a player need to have a good link with a medic or a therapist a rehab therapist um like i say within the club or external who can help you with that okay um because then, you know, if you've got a diagnosis, then, you know, 
perhaps you don't have many medics at the club, you've got a strength conditioning coach, a strength conditioning coach, if they've got time, can help you with that uh, uh, rehabil rehabilitation potentially if, if, they, if they have got, you know, wellness and the skill set to, to do that and help you. Um, but often or not, you know, that can be the issue when I see players where their rehab isn't going too well. Sometimes it's the clarity on the diagnosis, not the rehab program which they perform is the issue. It's, it's, it's uh, the wrong diagnosis and that's why they're not making progress. Um, and again, looking after the therapists here, many club medics, you know, often uh, very busy, very overworked. Um, so you, you need to give them the time to help you to get an accurate diagnosis. Um, so be respectful when they're assessing your teammates, okay? to allow them to do that assessment and spend time with them uninterrupted as far as possible um, so they can get a good clinical diagnosis and, and the, the teams that work well, you know, make sure that uh, those therapists uh, give the opportunity to do the job to the best of their abilities to support them, coaches and players to, to do that properly. Injury rehabilitation, um, just like we talk about with rugby, Basic handling, basic skills, you know, doing those well is what, you know, high performing teams do. I think it's the same when it comes to rehabilitation. OK, um, we need to do the basics really well and not skip over rehabilitation. Um, you know, just being pain free is not enough. From the research, we know that there's a lot of other uh, consequences of injury. Uh, we need to make sure that, that power, strength, reactivity, muscular control, all these things are back to normal as well, not just a, a pain-free limb or joint. Um, because if we just get to that point where we're pain-free and try and return to training or play often, this is where re-injuries can happen, okay? And this is the, the element where that first line there, when load, when the force on the tissues is greater than the, the, the tolerance or the capacity of the tissues, most of the time this is where injury happens. And this is where uh, in the gym uh, with good strength and conditioning, um, when, when, it, you know, when it's at the right stage during the healing process, good, good strength and conditioning programs develop that tissue tolerance capacity to withstand against the, the forces and loads that, that rugby throws at us uh, on a, on a daily basis in, in training and matches. Okay. And I think as well, um, you know, a lot of people, are, once you've got an accurate diagnosis on concussion and spinal injuries, uh, back problems, as accurate as, as, as you can, sometimes you can't get an accurate diagnosis around the spine. So, but they need to be rehabilitated like all of injuries. Uh, and we need to make sure that we have full function of the nervous system and, and the brain um, for returning to play. And, and again, it's it's too big a topic to discuss here. Um, but in particular, we should see concussion as any other injury uh, and provide good quality um, rehabilitation. So some of the examples there, the balance drills, visual drills, all really important. Tip six, equipment. Um, two quick points here. I won't spend too much time on this, um, but dental injuries are probably one of the biggest things that we can prevent against, okay? Dental injuries are expensive, uh, annoying injuries, um, can be, you know, cosmetically changing injuries for life. We're a gum shield, okay? Um, we can improve players' availability uh, and reduce... <laughs> Club or the uh, players' costs on dental bills by just this simple thing: get a good, good gum shield that fits and use it training and matches. Okay, um, there's some emerging evidence in youth ice hockey uh, that it can reduce certain concussions, certain types of concussion. So there's some interesting evidence around that at the moment. So. Uh, it isn't just about protecting your teeth, it potentially can reduce certain types of concussion as well. So another reason to wear it. Equipment. Um, making this point due to the 
uh, increase in the amount of 4G pitches and artificial pitches that are being used within rugby now. And um, I remember speaking to a podiatrist for Chelsea when I was down at London Welsh uh, with one of our players. Um, and uh, we were there for a different reason, but they, uh, the lady had this on the wall and uh, I asked her just to explain her thoughts. It was 10, 10 plus years ago now, um, but it was very interesting uh, with um, the players that she was working with in the English Premiership at the time. Uh, and she saw a pattern of this change to artificial surfaces and people still using maybe, you know, blades or, or kind of older style boots like the Adidas one up here. Uh, and with the lack of give in the ground and this kind of uh, fixation points on the outside, it would potentially create increased uh, pivot and rotational forces through a joint. Um, and the advice was to, to basically to, to wear the appropriate boots for the appropriate surface. So I know that's an added expense expenditure for some players but if you're training on one surface playing on others um, do wear the right boots uh, and I think they could be uh, from my experience uh, I've we've had a few uh, injuries ACL injuries and syndesmosis injuries and I wonder if if that had something to do with it uh, over the years uh, when we were using um, 4G services on a one-off when when we were never training on 4G services or were never playing on them. Um, so you can see there's this 20 to 24 studs on this bottom boot here, this 4G boot, and this more around the outside, 10 or 12 here. Okay, so that can be a way to reduce these types of injuries. Tip seven: concussion and neck injury prevention. Um, I think it doesn't matter now. Neck training, let me start again. Neck training predominantly uh, in in the early years of my career and, and working rugby teams surrounded uh, predominantly the forwards. Okay, the front three, front five. Okay, um, related to the scrum. But I think now with emerging evidence that um, we may be able to reduce certain types of concussion injury with neck strengthening programs. I think if there's one thing that all players take from this, coaches, is that in all positions across the squad, we need to reduce the risk of concussion and neck injuries with neck strengthening protocols, okay? And that can start off, you know, in the younger age groups, simple manual towels, bands. And as that player gets older, and it's, it's, uh, you know, 16, 17, 18, we can, we can progress that um, to more complex or higher load drills using cables and neck harnesses and weights plates um, so that they can develop some hypertrophy and real strength around that neck. Uh, and not just the neck as well, developing the trapezius as well with, with shrugs and other um, shoulder girdle drills that target those areas so i think um very important that that all players do this because we want to try and reduce the risk of the concussion in in all these players alongside the various other rules and uh, uh measures that are in place um just be careful with the timing around this if you're going to do heavy neck strength training again a bit like the the hamstring and the calf type work we don't want to do some really heavy neck training too close to scrums or too close to a match. Okay. Uh, we can just do more, like say lower load um, or activation drills or low volume uh, isometric heavy work. Um, that's, that's low in volume and uh, with minimal movement in the, in the build to a match, if that's useful and you've trialed it and it works for that individual player. Tackle technique, I think this is a massive area and there's been a lot of research in this area over the past few years. And it's something which um, seems so straightforward, but maybe has never been really considered 
in so much detail uh, until you know the injuries related around concussions, neck and shoulder injuries that have been so prominent in the professional game over the last five, 10 years has, has led to a big focus on this area. So there's one for the rugby coaches, but rugby players as well, because players and coaches, you know, coaches need to uh, provide um, good technical coaching detail around this area. Um, something I have conversations with the rugby trainer Ben John we have lots of conversations around this and it's a it's a big part and I think it's really important we need we need to develop physically robust players in the gym and we need to do that the the neck strength work like I just discussed but it doesn't matter how strong that neck is if 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 you're going to tackle recklessly or if you've got poor technique get your head and neck in the wrong position um it's going to lead to injuries so the research has been done out there uh, and, and the video analysis that's been done um, has uh, has pointed to, you know, optimal tackle, te opt optimal tackle techniques uh, and players need to drill this and practice this throughout their career, just like handling and ball skills. Um, you know, physios, you know, we, we're used to looking at maybe someone's running gait or analysing someone's jumping or hopping. This is another area. That's, that's biomechanical analysis for injury prevention. And I think therapists, we, there's an area we can look at as well and get involved with the coaches to, to question, you know, whether a player that's had re repeated stingers or shoulder injuries or neck injuries or concussions is there anything in their tackle technique here which is missing, which is uh, consistently bad? If, if you do have access to tape or, or video footage of players training or um, playing matches, and, and that needs to be done, you know, quite frequently. We might just need to limit how much we do, depending on the stage and the season, and the, and and using the appropriate equipment if possible. Okay, contact training can be done safely and just drilling tackle technique could be a good way of doing this um we need to be mindful world rugby produced contact load guidelines that have come out so obviously um we need to get the optimal amount done so that players get better without um, overly exposing them to too much contact so we need to supervise and coach that well i said about this earlier concussion injury risk and increased risk of rugby injury if, if you've had a concussion i think apart from just going through the standard protocols i think we need to start looking a lot more at balance at vision and incorporating that in the recovery process okay our players balance back to normal uh stand on one leg stand on two legs eyes closed stand on two legs moving the head side to side is a vision back to normal? Can we can we trace things? Can we track things? There's lots of very interesting drills that that we can do there to to help someone rehabilitate. Uh, and I think that could be um, something that can just help improve the standard of concussion care that we can give to these players alongside the next strength work. Um, and again, I've used. Uh, team drills and, and we can incorporate it with the, the hand-eye coordination drills so if you're, if you're looking at that we can add the, in that single leg balance while doing hand-to-eye hand coordination drills we could do hand-to-eye coordination drills while moving the head at the same time so there's lots of different things that we can do to test the brain and the nervous system make sure that's that's normal uh, as part of the following the, the the world rugby and the, your, your local unions concussion guidelines um tip nine recovery methods and recovery days uh, really important uh I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail of this we talked about earlier on it really is all this information is often given by your coaches and strength conditioning coaches every season every year but players they've got to do it okay they've got to get into good performance habits and routines and uh you know it's about what you do 90 percent of the time not 10 percent of the time that's why i say you know six days a week you know you, you've got to have some downtime and relax and uh, enjoy a good uh takeaway but it, it's what you do 90 percent of the time that's important okay um 
a slightly di different point here, and I've noticed that in the professional game, make sure recovery day really is a recovery day. Uh, too often, you know, so often I've seen players with horrifically tight calves after the day off, and, and all they've done is they've walked around on concrete in flip flops for about eight hours in a new town or a new city or uh, going for a wander on on tour, uh, and that's that's not recovery, okay, and and. Uh, that's a stress on the calves and the lower limbs. Um, so make sure uh, you look at other options. Uh, we've often uh, promoted light bike tours around towns. Uh, if on tour with teams is a better option uh, and minimizing that, that, that walking component in flip flops. And the final tip is making sure that we just cover that psychological element element as well of recovery recovery from injury uh, be it short or even more important even with those longer injuries where players have been out for a long period of time may have missed uh, the entire pre-season um, you know, we need to make sure that not just the physical gym and feel benchmarks are being ticked as a minimum but that psychologically the, the player is ready and that that joint and those tissues really have been tested um you know physically you know have before they start running high speed running have they really come through a decent amount of explosive plyometric jumping hopping work uh have they uh for the upper limb have they come through a lot of strength and explosive powerful work on wide angles in in in, in complex positions where players are going to find themselves on a pitch making that kind of game saving tackle chasing someone or someone being stepped you know that's the issue is it you know in the gym things come in us weights everything's in nice straight lines and angles on the field it's reactive you think you've got someone lined up they sidestep you overextend and reach um so it's, it's making sure that you you have enough robustness and resilience resilience to deal with that and by gradually exposing yourself to all these forces um you know you're, you're working on that psychological aspect you're building your own confidence back and then making sure that players have done enough technical and tactical training the coaches have that input in injured players or players that are lacking confidence um this is a big issue after lockdown uh, a lot more shoulder neck injuries being reported more so in the in the in the community and amateur game because People spent a lot of time doing workouts and gym work, but they hadn't had it had up, you know, up to two years, eighteen months, two years off off tackling um, at full intensity, and, and 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 they were rusty. So making sure that we're getting that right and we're getting that technical side done. And this is a simple scale psychological questionnaire that we use in sport, where. Um, we ask players, you know, as they're coming back from injury to answer six questions and score those six questions out of 100. OK, you can see the questions there. They give their score. We take that and uh, we divide that total by 10 and it gives us a number. And if that number falls in a certain range, then the research has shown that players are more likely to be psychologically ready to play. Uh, and if it falls below that range, um, then that player may need more time to work on those areas, uh, be it physical or technical um, aspects of their, of their rugby before return from injury. So there are lots of simple scales out there. And for therapists, there are more specific scales which you can use following uh, this, this similar scales for, for the ACL, for the knee and for, for shoulders following shoulder instability to determine someone's readiness to return to sport. And I highly suggest if you're a therapist seeking those out, if um, there's any queries around someone's psychological readiness. So summary and thoughts uh, for players and coaches, knowledge is power. Uh, and my equation is knowledge is power plus hard consistent work will improve, improve players' performance and decrease injury risk. And that's what we want, robust and resilient players. Um, so players, you know, get educated, ask questions of the people that you work with, the coaches, strength conditioning coaches, the therapists, be hungry to learn, not just about rugby, but ways that you can improve yourself. Okay. Uh, every member of the, of the 
of the the management and the support team can help you improve in a way um obviously there's lots of good advice but available out there on the internet but but be be aware of of the sources of the social media of the of, of where you get that information and be careful that the person creating that content is is up to date on the modern rugby game and and modern research regards injury prevention rehab and player welfare um and my final word of advice, especially over the last few years, and, and the big kind of um, uh, positive movement towards positive mental health and, and player welfare, uh, is supporting your, your, your fellow teammates that get injured, okay? You know, players need to support other players, coaches, and, uh, you know, not just the therapists there. Um, you know, injuries can be a very dark time and, and can have a massive impact, not just on that individual, but on the team and on the team's performance. So having a positive ethos and support and environment around injured players, making sure that we're inclusive, checking on them and um, reaching out to them uh, and helping them on their recovery journey, I think is massively important, OK? Because that's what, you know, that's what being in a team is all about. So, I mean, it's it's really important. So thank you very much um, for listening. And um, if you want to get in touch with me, some of my details here. Um, uh, I'm working um, as a physio. I finished my job with Russia. I'm working online and with private clients. Um, and plan to do some more talks in the future, uh, consultancy with various clubs. Um, and uh, I think we've got time for questions. So let me just make sure I can uh, look. So you can unmute yourselves now. Uh, and if, if, is there any particular questions from rugby players or coaches? If you want, you can chuck it in the, in the chat. Um, let me just stop, share the screen. Okay, let's have a look there. Actually, back on in case people want the information. Um, if you want to check a question in the chat, or if you want to unmute yourself, I don't mind. There's 34 people on the line here. So, uh, or if you want to uh, pass out and go to bed, that's also. Uh, an option as well but thank you very much for listening tonight um and if there's any questions like you say you can get in contact with me you can email me not a problem at all um misha is it michael e or is it misha or michael e yes i do have a list of those scales for injury and psychological assessment so if you want to message me not a problem i can get those to you um I, I try and put lots of good information and drills uh, and information around rugby injuries on my social media channels there. Um, I try and get back to people's questions and demands as much as possible. I'm not as good as the younger kids that seem to uh, produce a lot of uh, uh, stuff on social media, but I'm trying to get better at that. Um, question from Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for coming on and listening, mate. Number one thing an amateur player should do to prepare themselves for the upcoming season, okay? I would say that there's two elements there, okay? Um, physically, I think that um, I'm, I'm, I, I really, I, I, I've been involved with concussion retirements. Um, I've seen... Uh, that over the course of my career uh, up, to, up to three um, all very very different various things so anything we can do to reduce concussion risk so so players becoming equated be, being physically ready by uh, working on some of that next strength work that we've discussed okay to try and prevent certain types of concussion there's whiplash type concussions and just being uh, and then also understanding what concussion is if you're a young player okay the symptoms and communicating that to your coaches and your support staff okay there's no hiding those symptoms 
uh, okay, we, we're, we're, those days are done and dusted. Okay, we need to make sure we take this seriously. So communicate your issues to your coaches, to your support staff and get your neck as strong as possible. That's the, that's the one thing that I would, I would say right now, if we, can, if we can reduce a few concussions in the game, that'll be good for, for everyone and for the game itself. Thanks, Mike. Great question. Um, I had uh, I had another question from someone that couldn't attend tonight. Um, and that was surrounding um, some of the upper limb drills that I've been trying to um, describe and promote. So um, really just want to try and return to contact is a, uh, a challenging area and it's about having a good system in place. Um, I've got, uh, let's have a look. Got an additional slide I was going to show. Let's have a look here. Having a good system in place for contact, okay? And return to contact. And this is a little pathway that I've developed here uh, to help players go from, uh, and this is based on uh, Matt Tavner's work in football about trying to take someone from very controlled contact drills and then increasingly challenging the chaos and progressing from players to very simple contact, building their confidence, gradually exposing them to contact and introducing more chaotic environments, which more replicate the demands of the current of the, of the game. So it's having a system in place to do with that and um and this is this has been my thought process and I, i've got uh, more detail on this and, and i plan to try and share this a little bit more and i hope to maybe collaborate with people on this and and take it a step further um but it's, it's looking at the aspects growing with fan wrestle tack collision tackle collision carries and how we can um um gradually expose players, building their physical resilience and, and confidence. Um, so, so having a process in place and making sure, you know, whatever the upper limb injury is, as the person asked, you know, what's my process? At a certain point, all upper limb injuries will be very simple, be it an AC, be it a biceps tear, be it sure, at a certain stage in the healing and recovery process, it's going to be more about developing maximal strength and power in multiple joints, in wide angles, to mimic the demands of the game, and then gradually exposing them to those drills. So I put a lot of those drills that on my social media to try and challenge people in this early stage, in this high control stage. And then, um, then what we can do then is, after a few sessions, two or three sessions at this stage, and we can move on, and maybe there'll be two or three sessions in each of these stages until the player has, has developed their full full confidence there. Um, so that's kind of how my, my mindset and my thought process on upper limb return to play and, and contact there. Okay, let's have a look. Any question there? Okay, there's a few more questions there. Lewis, hi, Chris, what age is it best for children to start weight training for injury prevention? I think um, uh, with long-term athletic development, I think, you know, it follows and matches the development and the sport. So I think, um, you know, in that younger age group where it's more based on, on, on fund of just developing good movement patterns uh, is the first priority. And then, you know, if you think about it, as soon as they're starting to be involved with contact and contact forces, then really we should be preparing them for that. So um, if, if a player is, is going to be doing contact, then there's no reason why 
they shouldn't be doing controlled strength training for for their neck for their upper body for the lower body so it should follow their progression throughout that throughout the game if that makes sense in their development um uh, and i don't want to say a specific age because kids develop at, at different ages but they should be developing the fundamental movement qualities uh and strength and speed to 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 protect themselves against injury and i think um you know we often see a lot of shoulder dislocations um in that you know 16 17 18 you know 18 year old age group so i think we should be preparing if they're going to be in rugby uh and they're going to be exposing themselves to those forces we should be preparing them you know a couple of years prior to that um so i hope that answers that question uh michael e big problem for amateurs even more so in t2 t3 countries where rugby is not I think, uh, yeah, Michael, uh, Misha, I think there's a lot of, uh, I mean, it sounds going to sound generic here, but there's a lot of good inf information on the um, World Rugby website. And, and I suggest that, you know, people that are not um, familiar with, with rugby, they need to complete those courses. A lot of those courses are free um understanding uh the demands of the game there's 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 good information on those world rugby websites uh, and, and those people if they seriously want to be involved in rugby they need to go and, and get educated i i i wouldn't just walk into um handball without having done due diligence um and understanding the the demands of handball the demands of the training, the 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 common injuries and patterns of injuries. If you if you're a keen professional, um, just like an athlete is, is 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 dedicated to their training. If you're a, if you're a medic that is, um, uh, if you're a medic that is in is involved in rugby, then you need to understand the game and you need to understand the demands of the game and the injuries associated with that. So I think there's there's a lot of information, freely available information out there. You know, the 2022 Irish schoolboy uh, research paper freely available by a Google Scholar. So, I mean, you've got to dedicate yourself to um, improving player welfare and, and trying to reduce their injury risks. So I think that information is out there. Yeah, Nathan, it's uh, looking at the chat there. Yeah, Nathan, uh, it's yeah, it's a challenge. It's a challenge, and 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 um, it depends on what level of the game um, and the support surrounding those teams. It's 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 really hard, um, you know. Um, uh, and we just need to try and support and develop the staff at each individual club as best we can. Uh, uh, it's a, a lot of people that can often be a lot of volunteers with very little uh, professional qualifications working at some of these clubs for little or no pay. Um, and that's, that's why I think it's, it's, it's very important that, um, you know, um, there's a lot of free self-education out there and there's a lot of education available out there and, 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 and cost-effective education. And I think that's, that's really important. And I, hope to do i plan to do some more courses in the future and i, I, and I like to make them cost effective as well and uh, available for all um uh right let me just check is there any other questions in the chat there I'm, I'm happy i'm happy to stay to half nine or if everyone's happy and wants to get off and chill out and relax then likewise again you know i'm happy for people to contact me and um uh, those that attend it you know if, if you want the recording 
not a problem. Um, I can get that to you. Probably um, put it as like an unlisted, uh, or, or might even list it on YouTube. Um, but I can get the link out to you um, and any other questions. But yeah, and uh, and if anyone's interacted with me on social media before, sorry if I haven't got back to you for various questions. I had a little baby girl, she's four months old. The past few months have been crazy. The, the, the Russia job ended like that. And I suddenly had to find myself back on my feet working. And I had the baby within the same week or two weeks. So the past few months have been pretty pretty nuts um so uh I, i'll try and keep posting and getting good information out there uh or at least i think it's good information as much as possible out there to players coaches and um therapists and again um if people are interested in me doing something a little bit more related to uh, directly for the therapist then that's something that i, I plan to do it in the in the near future um, Okay. Yeah, no problem, Mike. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Nath. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you, everyone. Is that you, Rian? <laughs> no, Rian. <laughs> Hi, Ari. I hope you're well. And uh, let's catch up sometime. Okay. Um, thank you very much, guys. Um, it is 25 past nine. So if you have any last minute questions, put them on the line now. If no other questions uh, come up, then I will I will say good night and thank you very much all for attending and listening. I hope it was useful. Uh, and if it helped to reduce someone's injury risk, then, then I've done my job. It helps to, to reduce one person's injury risk at one team somewhere in, in, the, in the country uh, or in the UK, then I'm happy that I've helped. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much.